Today's video is partially sponsored by Outs. Outs is a growing general store, providing essential items for those out active. Their featured item, this rechargeable lighter. In case you run out of fuel, keep this around and it will solve your problem. It's windproof and comes with waterproof protection in case it gets wet. Get your rechargeable lighter. It's $20, links in the description. Not going to waste any time in between, let's get into the story. The Colombo crime family is an Italian-American mafia crime family and one of the youngest of the five families that dominate organized crime activities in New York City. It was during Lucky Luciano's organization of the American Mafia after the Castellamarese War, following the assassinations of Joe the Boss Messeria and Salvador Maranzano, that the gang run by Joseph Profasi became recognized as the Profasi crime family. The family has been torn by three internal wars. The first war took place during the late 1950s, when Caporigem, Joe Gallo, aka Crazy Joe, revolted against Profasi. In his youth, Crazy Joe was diagnosed with schizophrenia after an arrest. He soon became an enforcer in the Profasi crime family, later forming his own crew, which included his brothers Larry and Albert. In 1957, Joe Profasi allegedly asked Gallo and his crew to murder Albert Anastasia, the boss of the Gambino crime family. Anastasia was of the founders of the modern American Mafia and a co-founder and later boss of the Murder Incorporated organization. He also controlled New York City's waterfront for most of his criminal career, including the dock worker unions. He was one of the most ruthless and feared organized crime figures in American history. His reputation earned him the nicknames, the Earthquake, the One Man Army, Mad Hatter and Lord High Executioner. Anyway, on the morning of October 25, 1957, Anastasia entered the barber shop of the Park Sheraton Hotel at 56th Street and 7th Avenue in Midtown Manhattan. Anastasia's driver parked the car in an underground garage and then took a walk outside, leaving him unprotected. As Anastasia relaxed in the barber's chair, two men's scarves covering their faces rushed in, shoved the barber out of the way, and fired at Anastasia. After the first volley of bullets, Anastasia reportedly lunged at his killers. However, the stunned Anastasia had actually attacked the gunman's reflections in the wall mirror of the barber shop. The gunman continued firing until Anastasia finally fell dead on the floor. The job was complete for Profasi, but the next year, he would fall out of favor. In contrast to Profasi's generosity to his relatives and the church, many of his men considered him miserly and mean with money. One reason for their rancor was that Profasi required each family member to pay him a $25 a month tithe, an old Sicilian gang custom. The money, which amounted to approximately $50,000 a month, was meant to support the families of mobsters in prison. However, most of this money stayed with Profasi. In addition, Profasi did not tolerate any dissent from his policies, and people who expressed discontent were murdered. On February 27, 1961, the Gallo brothers kidnapped four of Profasi's top men. Underboss Joseph Magliacco, Frank Profasi, Joe Profasi's brother, Caporigem Salvador Musacchia and soldier John Simon. Profasi himself eluded capture and flew to sanctuary in Florida. While holding the hostages, Larry and Albert sent Joe to California. The Gallows demanded a more favorable financial scheme for the hostages' release. Joe wanted to kill one hostage and demand $100,000 before negotiations, but his brother Larry overruled him. After a few weeks of negotiation, Profasi and his consigliere, Charles the Sige Lasicero, made a deal with the Gallows and secured the peaceful release of the hostages. However, Profasi had no intention of honoring this peace agreement. On August 20, 1961, he ordered the murders of Larry Gallo and Joseph Joe Jelly Gioielli, a member of the Gallo crew. Gunman allegedly murdered Gioielli after inviting him to go fishing. Larry survived a strangulation attempt by Persico and Salvador Sally D'Ambrosio at the Sahara Club in East Flatbush after a police officer intervened. The Gallo brothers had been previously aligned with Persico against Profasi and his loyalists, they then began calling Persico the snake after he had betrayed them. The gang war continued, resulting in nine murders and three disappearances. Persico was indicted later that year for the attempted murder of Larry Gallo but the charges were dropped when Larry refused to testify. In 1961, Gallo was convicted of conspiracy and extortion for attempting to extort money from a businessman and was sentenced to 7 to 14 years in prison. While serving his sentence, Gallo was incarcerated at three New York State prisons. 
Greenhaven Correctional Facility, Attica Correctional Facility, and Auburn Correctional Facility. While Gallo was imprisoned, Profasi died of cancer in 1962, Magliaco took over, and the Gallo crew attempted to kill Carmine Persico in 1963. While at Greenhaven, Gallo became friends with African-American drug trafficker Leroy Nicky Barnes. Gallo predicted a power shift in the Harlem drug rackets towards black gangs and coached Barnes on how to upgrade his criminal organization. In 1963, Joseph Bonanno, the head of the Bonanno crime family, made plans to assassinate several rivals on the Mafia Commission bosses Tommy Lucchese, Carlo Gambino, and Stefano Magadino, as well as Frank Desimon. Bonanno sought Magliaco's support, and Magliaco readily agreed. Not only was he bitter from being denied a seat on the commission, but Bonanno and Profasi had been close allies for over 30 years prior to Profasi's death. Bonanno's audacious goal was to take over the commission and make Magliaco his right-hand man. Magliaco was assigned the task of killing Lucchese and Gambino, and gave the contract to one of his top hit men, Colombo. However, the opportunista Colombo revealed the plot to its targets. The other bosses quickly realized that Magliaco could not have planned this himself. Remembering how close Bonanno was with Magliaco, and before him, Profasi, as well as their close ties through marriages, the other bosses concluded Bonanno was the real mastermind. The commission summoned Bonanno and Magliaco to explain themselves. Fearing for his life, Bonanno went into hiding in Montreal, leaving Magliaco to deal with the commission. Badly shaken and in failing health, Magliaco confessed his role in the plot. The commission spared Magliaco's life, but forced him to retire as Profasi family boss and pay a $50,000 fine. As a reward for turning on his boss, Colombo was awarded the Profasi family. At the age of 41, Colombo was one of the youngest crime bosses in the country. He was also the first American-born boss of a New York crime family. When NYPD Detective Albert Seidman, later the NYPD Chief of Detectives, called Colombo in for questioning about the death of one of his soldiers, Colombo came to the meeting without a lawyer. He told Seidman, I am an American citizen, first class. I don't have a badge that makes me an official good guy like you, but I work just as honest for a living. On August 29, 1964, Gallo sued the Department of Corrections, stating that guards inflicted cruel and unusual punishment on him at Greenhaven after he allowed a black barber to cut his hair. The prison commissioner characterized Gallo as a belligerent inmate and an agitator. On May 9, 1966, Colombo was sentenced to 30 days in jail for contempt by refusing to answer questions from a grand jury about his financial affairs. In April 1970, Colombo created the Italian-American Civil Rights League, the month his son Joseph Colombo Jr. was charged with melting down coins for resale as silver ingots. In response, Joseph Colombo Sr. claimed FBI harassment of Italian-Americans and, on April 30, 1970, sent 30 picketers outside FBI headquarters at 3rd Avenue and 69th Street to protest the federal persecution of all Italians everywhere. This went on for weeks. The purpose of the movement was to deny the Mafia existed and brand anyone who claimed so as an anti-Italian racist. The movement caught on quickly. On June 29, 1970, 50,000 people attended the first Italian Unity Day rally in Columbus Circle in New York City. Unlike other mob leaders who shunned the spotlight, Colombo appeared on television interviews, fundraisers and speaking engagements for the League. In 1971, Colombo aligned the League with rabbi and political activist Meir Kahane's Jewish Defense League, claiming that both groups were being harassed by the federal government. Patriarcha family boss Raymond L. S. Patriarcha negotiated a peace agreement between the warring two factions. In early 1971, Joe Gallo was released from prison. As a supposedly conciliatory gesture, Colombo invited Gallo to a peace meeting with an offering of $1,000. Gallo refused the invitation, wanting $100,000 to stop the conflict, which Colombo refused to pay. At that point, acting boss Vincenzo Alloy issued a new order to kill Gallo. This would start the Second War. On March 11, 1971, after being convicted of perjury for lying on his application to become a real estate broker, Colombo was sentenced to two and a half years in state prison. The sentence, however, was delayed pending an appeal. Colombo was a godfather, and godfathers themselves were expected to avoid publicity at all costs, as publicity was deemed bad for business. This cardinal rule was being brazenly broken by Joe Colombo. 
Oh Godfather Columbo went public, courting the media spotlight like a rock star, a persona John Gotti would later emulate. Although he had many supporters, not everyone favored him in his new role. Members of the commission, the ruling body of the mafia headed by the godfathers of New York's five families, became aghast at Columbo's public antics, most notably Carlo Gambino. The FBI was also on his heels. Just a few years earlier, the FBI, on the orders of President Hoover himself, framed Sonny Franzese, a member of the Colombo family. He was sentenced to 50 years for a string of bank robberies he had no part in. The reason is unknown. On June 28, 1971, Colombo held the second Italian Unity Day rally in Columbus Circle. The crowd was much thinner than the previous rally, due to the Gambino crew and Crazy Joe's crew telling their men not to attend. Columbo was shot three times, left jaw and lower parts of the right side of the head. He was taken to Roosevelt Hospital, a stream of blood gushing from his neck and mouth. The sudden spurt of gunfire took place shortly after 11.45 am, within 100 feet of the Christopher Columbus statue. Pandemonium engulfed the area, sending hysterical spectators, many of them women clutching small children, spilling uptown toward 61st Street. Both uniformed and plainclothes men who were in the area, were initially as stunned as the spectators. Within seconds, however, a phalanx of policemen, abetted by rally captains of the Civil Knights League, which Colombo founded last year, were cordoning off the scene of the violence. Colombo's assailant, 25-year-old black man named Jerome A. Johnson, of 88 through Pavenue, New Brunswick, NJ, was shot to death at the scene, but it was still not clear who had shot him, the police, associates of Colombo or unknown third parties. The police reported that Johnson was wearing a special Unity Day press pass that he obtained from officials sponsoring the Italian-American Civil Rights League rally. The police released a photograph showing Johnson taking motion pictures of Colombo, which they said was taken seconds before he shot him. It raised a question whether Johnson could have acted alone, since he had to put down the rented camera, which was missing, and fire automatic pistol at Colombo in seconds. Another theory was that someone took the camera from Johnson and handed him the pistol. The police have said that the pistol fired at Colombo was taken from Johnson's body at the scene of the shooting, but would not comment on whether it contained Johnson's fingerprints. Johnson used a Bolex movie camera that they say he rented from a camera store in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Chief Seedman said that the camera rented by Johnson, which was missing, was paid for by Johnson with a check that bounced. Rubber checks appear to have played a part in Johnson's activities. Greenwich Village store owner, Anthony Monopoli, reported that Jerome A. Johnson had written a $27.12 check on June 18 in payment for some articles and the check also bounced. He was said to seem to have money, but didn't have any money. According to a piece written by essayist, Michael Gonzalez, Soul Assassins, Johnson explained to friends in New England that he was going to make a documentary about America after the Vietnam War. He left Cambridge on Sunday, June 27, a day before the shooting, with a white woman, the camera and a monkey in a carrying cage. He'd supposedly bought the monkey on the street as a present for his Massachusetts hostess, but when she rejected the gift, Johnson brought the hairy beast back to New York. Police were wondering whether or not Johnson was acting as a lone shooter or with one or two accomplices. Several eyewitnesses gave accounts of the frenzied scene. Carl Sikora, a 30-year-old rally captain, said, I was standing by the fence and Joe was talking to everybody. This colored girl came up to him and said, hello, Joe. And he smiled and said, hi. Yeah. She was with a guy, a colored guy taking pictures, and they asked Joe to pose and everyone to spread out, and before you know it, the shooting started, Mr. Sikora said. Everybody jumped on him, the man with a gun. Mr. Sikora said the girl and a companion fled and were over the barricade before anyone realized. I saw the colored guy lying on the ground and he looked dead to me. At this point, Mr. Sikora was interrupted by detectives and was taken in for questioning. Thomas Reed, who said he heard two shots, maybe three, and along with other policemen pounced on a black man with a gun. It was all over in a matter of seconds, Inspector Reed said. I saw a hand sticking out with a gun and I jumped for the gun. A shot went off, Inspector Reed said, we were holding on to his hand, I don't know who shot the black man. This is why many may consider this a conspiracy. 1. The people who allegedly shot Johnson was never apprehended. Also he was known to mostly associate with whites, as police could not find one black friend. 2. Johnson was in police custody before he was shot, and if two or three shots went off, how were both he and Columbo shot? 
3. The chief said that the people known to be Joseph Colombo's bodyguards were not right next to Joe Colombo when he was shot. He said several bodyguards were known to the police, but declined to identify them, saying only that their absence at the time of the shooting might be significant. I suppose it is unusual, the chief said, but the possibility exists that there were other bodyguards not known to us. If the bodyguards weren't close to Colombo, how could they retaliate to shoot Johnson? There was much controversy over this. In 2016, Joe's son Anthony Colombo said he believed the FBI were responsible for trying to kill his father, not gangsters. Also alluding to the fact that Johnson was committing a suicide act. What type of mind would Johnson have to have to think he would shoot Joe Colombo and get away with it? Kind of doesn't make sense. But let's look into Johnson a little further. There are accounts of frightened woman who said Johnson had forced her to live with him and of a detective and a co-ed in New Jersey who knew him as a fascinating campus drop-in. The frightened woman who asked that her name be withheld was found at a West Side address where Johnson was reported to have lived recently. She said she met him at the same Rutgers University campus where officials said he used to hang around. He presented himself as a lawyer, the woman said, and offered to help her with a minor police problem. One day he showed up at her apartment, she said, and that was the start of three months of torture. From time to time, she was beaten and sexually assaulted. She spoke of Johnson's talking into the night, contending he was God and admiring Italians. Her said that she had called the police on three occasions to have him ejected, but he always returned, sometimes he would jump out from a dark corner, press the machete to her body, and warn her against calling the police, she said. He left for good about three weeks ago, the woman said, when her former lover, a man named Ed, returned to live with her. The woman said Johnson talked at length of many things. Society was against him because he was black was one theme, she said. The Italians was another, she said, recalling that he said something to the effect that the Italians are really with it they understand silver. Johnson would talk about things that made no sense, the woman said, as well as of his desire to make a lot of money. He would say that society owed him this, she added. Another tenant in the building recalled Johnson as a man who seemed to have delusions of grandeur and spoke of the wickedness of society. When she heard the news of the Colombo assault and of the killing of a man named Johnson as the assailant, the woman continued, she knew instantly that it was he, not another Johnson. He also claimed that the New Jersey Mafia was after him. He was a spellbending conversationalist who first fascinated, but then frightened, some of the co-eds at the university. There he was known as the Pisces Man, because of his constant talk of astrology. He put on a skit about Scorpio and death, and eventually drifted away after students complained. Other traces turned up in Greenwich Village, where a police detective recalled arresting Johnson June 4 on drug possession charges, and a shopkeeper reported Johnson wrote a bad check June 18. The city police detective who arrested Johnson on June 4 was Charles Zambri of the Charles Street Station in the village. He was called with his partner, Detective James Walsh, to the Christopher Hotel, a five-story building at Christopher Street and the West Side Highway frequented by truck drivers and itinerants. The desk clerk thought he recognized a man pictured in an FBI homicide flyer wanted poster from California. Fingerprints eventually disproved this, but in the meantime the suspect, who was registered at the $6 a night hotel as Jerome A. Johnson, was booked on drug charges. The detective said hashish and marijuana were found in a leather briefcase Johnson carried, but these charges were dropped later by the district attorney's office on the ground of an illegal search. Johnson stayed at the hotel only one night. In his briefcase, Johnson's only bit of luggage, they found a number of pictures, the detective said, only one of which he recognized, that of Hitler. There was also a picture of Hitler at the New Brunswick home where his mother lived and where Johnson spent most of his life. The police suspected Johnson was a Colombo bodyguard. He had a record of seven arrests in New York, New Jersey and California. The arrests were for such charges as burglary, forced rape and robbery in the last four years, with the police records thus far unclear on the outcome of most of the cases. Records list the occupation supplied by Johnson as playwright and astrologer, according to New Brunswick Police. Recollections presented thus far agree on a number of points, that Johnson a black was an addy dresser, greatly interested in cameras and the zodiac. He had a gift for small talk that he frequently put to use with young women, particularly white women. Jerome Johnson's last known address was 180 Christopher Street, above a gay bar called Christopher's End. 
The bar was managed by a friend of Johnson's, Michael Lummers, a known pornographer, and the building was owned by Paul Diabella, a member of the Gambino family. Ummers, a partner in crime with FBI informant Ed Murphy, had used Johnson's skill as a cameraman in the production of pornography. The Gambino family, so the NYPD thought, could also make use of such a man. That camera and others at the event in one of the most open public spaces in Manhattan, however, failed to capture a single frame of the face of the woman who was with Jerome Johnson. Nor could Johnson's many friends in New York and New Jersey give any indication who that woman might have been. Jerome Johnson had a pattern to his private life, given that women in three different states claimed he had sexually assaulted them. Johnson somehow managed to escape prosecution in each of these serious cases. Between numerous girlfriends, there was positive and negative feedback. When it came to his partners, however, Johnson did not discriminate in regards to race nor gender, and had many gay lovers. Because Crazy Joe had been rubbing shoulders with the blacks, such as Nicky Barnes, the shooter was suspected to be associated with Crazy Joe. Also, some days before the shooting, allegedly, Colombo told Scarpa, a Colombo crime family hitman, that he had seen a crew of black guys circling his neighborhood. He said he felt like it was an attempt by Crazy Joe to intimidate him. Colombo was paralyzed from the shooting. On August 28, 1971, after two months at Roosevelt Hospital in Manhattan, Colombo was moved to his estate at Blooming Grove. A year after the Colombo shooting, on April 7, 1972, around 4.30 a.m., Gallo and his family entered Umberto's Clam House in Manhattan's Little Italy. He went to celebrate his 43rd birthday with sister Carmela, wife Sina, her daughter Lisa, his bodyguard Peter Pete the Greek Diapaulas, and Diapaulas' companion. Earlier that evening, the Gallo party had visited the Capacabana with Jerry Orbich and his wife, Marta, to see a performance by comedian Don Rickles and singer Peter Lemangelo. Once at Umberto's, the Gallo party took two tables, with Gallo and Diapaulas facing the wall. Rickles and Lemangelo, whom Gallo had invited to join them at Umberto's, managed to find an excuse to get out of the engagement, possibly saving their lives. Colombo associate Joseph Luparelli claimed he was sitting at the bar, unbeknownst to Gallo. When Luparelli saw Gallo, he claimed he immediately left Umberto's and walked to a Colombo hangout two blocks away. After contacting Iacovelli, Luparelli said he recruited Colombo associates Philip Gambino, Carmine Sonny Pinto Dibius, and two other men, reputedly members of the Patriarca family to kill Gallo, due to their belief the Colombo family had a contract on Gallo's life. On reaching Umberto's, Luparelli said he stayed in the car, and the other four men went inside through the back door. Between seafood courses, Luparelli asserted the four gunmen walked into the dining room and opened fire with 32 and 38 caliber revolvers. Gallo swore and attempted to draw his handgun, but 20 shots were fired at him, and he was hit in the back, elbow and buttock. After overturning a butcher block dining table, Gallo staggered to the front door. Witnesses claimed that he was attempting to draw fire away from his family. Diapaulas was shot once in the hip. The mortally wounded Gallo stumbled into the street and collapsed. He was taken in a police car to Beekman Downtown Hospital, where he was pronounced dead. In 1975, a court-ordered examination showed that Colombo could move his thumb and forefinger on his right hand. In 1976, there were reports that he could recognize people and utter several words. On May 22, 1978, Colombo would die of cardiac arrest at St. Luke's Hospital in Newburgh. The crazy Joe Gallo murder has since went unsolved. This about wraps it up for this one though. Please like, comment, and subscribe.